As a mortician, you must be on call 24-7. A late-night body retrieval for one family came with a disturbing set of requests. There is a list of jobs people find attractive, and being a funeral director is definitely not one of them. It goes without saying, you have to be able to separate your emotions from the job for several reasons. Grieving families often lash out, and you can be the target of their attacks. I wish that was all that happened a few nights ago. It might surprise you to learn that the odd hours I have to work don't bother me much, because most of the time it means I can do whatever I please. Unfortunately, this call came just as I was about to reach second base with my girlfriend Stacy. Can't you just ignore that damn thing for once? It wasn't the first time I'd had a call when I was busy trying to get laid, but I knew better than to let it go to voicemail. You know this job depends on my reputation. I can't afford a sour client, especially not in a small town like this. Stacy was already getting dressed, a look of frustration on her face. Hey, I'll be back in less than a couple of hours. You don't have to leave, I told her. Yes, I do. Just forget it, Marcus she said with a huff as she pushed past me. I sighed, running my fingers through my hair and hoping that this call wouldn't be the one that ended our relationship. Then I checked the message to see who it was. Eldon Family Estate requesting immediate retrieval of recently deceased. I knew the name well. Thomas Eldon was probably one of the richest men in town. Their place sat near the edge of town near a small lake, an enormous townhouse that towered over the water like a medieval castle. Maybe he was the one that kicked the bucket finally? I thought to myself as I gathered my things and hopped in my car. It was only a short drive to the funeral home. I tried to call the number back on the way there, but it kept going straight to their voicemail, and the automated message said that the mailbox was full. I was going to have to go in blind on this call, so I gathered as much supplies as I would need and then loaded up the hearse. It started to snow, making the drive a bit cumbersome due to the weather, but the brightness of the flurries did make the road a little easier to see. I saw it well before I got there, just as dark and gloomy as I remember it being the last time I'd come to these woods. Not that I had ever stepped foot inside. Growing up, most kids knew better than to try and mingle with the ultra-rich family. The Eldons kept to themselves, sending their children to private schools and handling most of their business internally. Maybe that was why I had a bad feeling when I drove past the Iron Gate. It felt like I was trespassing or entering somewhere that I didn't belong. The cold settled down to my bones as I stepped out of my vehicle and stared at the silhouette of the mighty house. It was quiet, not another vehicle within sight. The place honestly looked deserted. As I got a little closer, I thought I smelled something. I've been around death long enough to recognize the odor, but this was different. It reminded me of a rotting barrel of fish I had come across once near the lake, wet and soggy and filled with maggots and guts and feces. Whatever had happened inside this house, it wasn't normal. I knocked on the wide framed door, trying to get a look through the smeared windows. Most of the furniture was covered up with clothes, the rest was dusty. Did anyone even live here? Had someone called me out here just to play a prank? Just as I was considering getting in my car and driving away, I heard a noise and the door creaked open. Only darkness invited me to step forward. Hello? My voice echoed in the empty foyer. It's Marcus Lavis from the funeral home. I got your message about half an hour ago, I said, clutching my coat and looking around the dusty and dark house. My initial assumption about the place looking abandoned felt confirmed as I looked about. There weren't any lights in the house and most of the furniture was covered with sheets and dust. It felt haunted. I saw a tiny ordained box next to a large frame that looked like it had once held a mirror and opened it to see a carved wooden mask inside and a note. Wear this, what is this for? I asked, looking down at the item. No one answered and I realized perhaps I was being watched. I became immediately uncomfortable with the fact that it fit so comfortably. Next, a clicking noise came from the far end of the hall and I saw another door creak open. Will I need the gurney? I called out, but again, there was no response. I stood in the doorway of the empty and foreboding house, flustered and confused and honestly frightened. 
I'd heard rumors that this family was strange, but that this was definitely on another level. I followed the carpet to the back of the hallway, where I saw more empty frames hanging on the wall. Each of them looked like they had once held family portraits and had been torn out. The wallpaper was peeling away and the floor felt cold. It was like entering a crypt. There were doors heading to rooms, but they were locked and looked like they hadn't been used in some time. Most of the place seemed unused. I thought I heard something behind me and jumped a little when a black cat rushed up my leg and into my arms. Its soft eyes looked up at me curiously as I glanced toward the room it had emerged from. For some reason I was sure that someone else was there in the shadows, silently watching us. The cat then jumped from my arms and walked to the ramp that entered the den, obviously expecting me to follow. I had another look toward the shadowy room, again feeling the presence of something else there, before doing just that. I heard the sound of oxygen and a heart monitor the moment I walked in, and I realized that the small den had been fashioned as a medical suite. As soon as I saw my host, I did my best to hold back a sharp gasp. Thomas Eldon looked like he had died fifteen years ago. He was hunched over in a wheelchair wearing an old gray suit that barely clung to his misshapen body. His arms and legs were bone-thin and covered with lesions, his face shrunken and his skin pulled back almost to his skull. He was wearing an oxygen mask that covered up the wounds near his nose and mouth, most of which was covered in sores and his right eye was missing, replaced by one made of glass that had dulled ages ago. I imagined what his days were probably like. Every breath he took was likely painful, every movement likely filled with soreness and swelling. His head turned in a mechanical way as his good eye focused on me. To my bewilderment and trepidation, the old man was smiling. It was the most dreadful smile I have ever seen, and I thanked the stars I had the mask on to hide my revulsion. Was that why I was asked to wear it so I wouldn't show my fear? I stood there staring at each other for what felt like an eternity. Then he spoke, his voice as coarse as a gravel road, scratchy and deep. At last, it is time, I am ready. He wheezed and coughed, and I tried to offer him water from a nearby pitcher, but my ancient host swatted his hand away. I decided to cut to the chase and get straight to business. The sooner I left this place, the better. I'm sorry for your loss, sir, I told him as I looked around the room. There were no windows here, no lights save for a few dimly lit candles and what was coming from his medical equipment. It felt more like a prison cell than a comfortable home. My remark made him tremble with a wheezy laugh. Are you? I would think a patron of death would welcome such events, Thomas responded. I clasped my hands together in front of me, hoping he would see I meant no ill will. In times like this, I know it can be difficult. What I mean by what I said is I promise I will do my best to handle this matter with the utmost of decency and respect for your deceased loved one. Again, he laughed and this time grabbed hold of his wheelchair like he was about to cough up a lung. Is that why you think you were summoned here? Because of love? He glared at me with his dull eye shining against the candlelight. I hated them. All of them. They mean nothing to me. His words made me shudder because I knew he meant them. I cleared my throat and again tried to find something in the room to focus on besides his ghastly face. I saw what looked like an ornate box behind him, probably large enough for him to sleep in. It suddenly occurred to me that there wasn't a bed anywhere in sight, so it was entirely possible he actually used the casket for rest. I kept my eyes averted to the coffin, my heart pounding faster as I tried to speed up the conversation. You said you wished to speak with me before I obtained the body? Thomas responded by reaching into his pocket with one of his bony hands and took out a wad of cash and passed it to me. It looked to be about a hundred thousand dollars or more. There will be double that amount if you, if you do what I ask, he rasped. At first I was thinking this is more money than I had ever seen in my career. Then, that feeling of dread welled up inside me again. Sir, what exactly are you asking me to do? I didn't even finish the sentence because I wasn't sure I wanted the answer. My stomach started to twist a bit as I recalled the stench from earlier. You must take the body tonight. No questions asked. Take it, destroy it, and don't look at it. Those are, um, odd requests, I said as I looked at the money and tried to count it up. 
It was all large bills and looked to be about a hundred thousand dollars or more. You must promise me, Mr. Levis. He snapped as he pushed his bony face close to mine. His breath smelled putrid. I, I, uh, I promise, I said, trying to compose myself. Nothing about this was making sense. Wasn't that what I was supposed to do anyway? Why did he want the body disposed of tonight? Something was horribly wrong. I was trying my best to think of a way to leave, to call Stacy and just let the county coroner handle this. Damn my job, I just want it out of here. Thomas coughed again and then reached for something else, a small silver whistle. Pushing it against his blistered lips, he blew a sharp noise and I heard another click from behind me. I thought I heard scratching on the other side of the wall, the hair on the back of my head standing up. What the fuck was happening here? I, I need to get a few things from my car, I said as I stepped back toward the ramp. Thomas said nothing instead just sitting there like he was anticipating the arrival of someone or something. Cautiously, I moved toward the main entrance, the shadowy rooms becoming more unpleasant as I passed them by. The scratching against the walls became more persistent as well. I was just about to open the door to literally bolt to my car when I heard the floor creak behind me. I jumped out of my skin again when the cat skirted across the floor, and then another figure emerged from the shadows, this one a girl that looked no older than maybe eleven. She had black hair and was wearing what looked like a hospital gown with bare feet and a few bruises on her legs. Her eyes were as green as the grass outside. She picked up her pet and stared up at me innocently. Are you here for four? She fumbled with the words, unable to finish the sentence. My mouth became dry again, a heavy knot forming in my throat as I let go of the doorknob. Yes, yes, that's right. She pet the cat for a little while, then let it go, shuffling her feet as it rushed back to the shadows. I don't want them to go. Please don't take them, she told me. Her eyes glistened with fresh tears. I got down on my knees and did my best to offer her comfort. Sweetie, I'm, I'm sorry. I know this is hard, I said as I touched her cheek. She reacted with anger, pushing me away and running toward the shadows. You can't take them. I won't let you. She screamed as she picked up something from a small coffee table and chunked it at me. I flinched and held up my hands to avoid the hurtling object, only to find a palm in front of my face grasping the small glass fruit that she had tossed. Thomas gave the girl a stern look, pushing his wheelchair toward the table and then placing the antique back where it belonged. Rosa, you know what must happen here, Eldon said sternly. She looked down at the ground and sniffled softly. I don't want them to go. Speak, and yet they must. It's for the best, Thomas insisted sternly. It was clear that he wasn't breathing well so far from his oxygen, and I wondered if the old man might collapse here in the foyer just for giving a lecture to this child. The girl said nothing, still looking at the floor. I took a step toward her, the shadowy room enveloping me as I offered her a soft hug. I promise I will make sure they are taken care of. I'll make sure you get to say goodbye. Okay? I told her. She nodded and hugged me back, even giving me a soft smile. You can help us, she whispered back to me as she passed something into my open palm. I got the impression it was meant to be a secret, so as I stood up, I covertly slipped it into my pocket to look at later when Thomas wasn't hovering over me. She ran off into the shadows past Eldon, who gave me a bizarre look like he was trying to comprehend why I had shown kindness to her. You have a way with children, Mr. Levis, the old man observed. No one should have to experience death so young, especially not when it's so much at one time, I told him. I felt so sorry for the little girl as she disappeared into the house, trying to imagine what her life here must be like. Is she the only one left? I asked him. The old man didn't bother answering. Instead, he rolled over to the door he'd mentioned earlier and took out a set of keys to unlock it revealing a long, thin set of stairs that led to darkness below. The body is down there? I asked, staring into the abyss. It reeked of despair and sadness and loneliness. I thought again about leaving. Then I remembered the girl. By now I knew something about this house was wrong. A new goal had started to ferment in my mind. Get this job done, and then find a way to get that poor girl away from here. Child Protective Services would surely feel her life here was no better than a prisoner once they saw how she was treated. 
With that new goal in mind, I took a step toward the basement. I was four steps down when I realized Thomas was watching me from the top step. Is there a, any light down here? I asked him. He muffled something under his breath and then returned a moment later when an old oil lantern. Was nothing except that medical suite run by electricity here? I took the lantern and turned toward the stairs again. They seemed to stretch forever downward. Mr. Levice, Eldon barked as I reached the middle of the stairs. His silhouette was eclipsed by the dim light, his misshapen body looking like a hell beast. Remember our promise, he whispered. Then he closed the door, leaving me in the dank room alone. I'm an idiot. That's what I was thinking in that moment. This is how horror movies play out. Yet there I was, putting one foot in front of the other because I honestly didn't feel I had any other choice. I covered my mouth to try and hold back the smell as I walked to the bottom, the vast basement opening up before me once I reached the last step. The place was old, probably older than the rest of the house, built on stone and brick. Some parts of it looked like it was about to cave in. There was junk everywhere, items and memorabilia and family heirlooms shoved away from the rest of the house. All of it looked like it was covered in some kind of rot or internal fluids the sort of which you might see from entrails that spill out when infected. And in the back of the room sat a small stone coffins, no larger than the girl I had met upstairs. That knot in my stomach twisted end over end. I kept the lantern at the level of my eyes, my heart pounding as I stepped over the mess toward it. As I got closer, I saw something near the wall, chains and broken pieces of glass, stains against the brick which probably were dried blood. Everywhere I looked, there were signs of torture. I reached into my pocket and took out my cell phone, immediately trying to call 911. No reception. Of course not. Fuck me. I approached the coffin, my hands shaking as I pushed off the cover to peer inside. I don't know exactly what I was expecting to see. Certainly not an eight-year-old boy, with arms crossed like he was asleep and dressed like he was going to boarding school. It was his eyes that made me want to scream. They were as black as the room around me. Motionless and full of blood and tears, his still eyes stared up into my soul. I averted my gaze, expecting his lifeless body to leap and attack me at a moment's notice. The basement made a low moaning noise to heighten my anxiety, and I held the lantern closer to the boy to try and determine the cause of death. No lacerations, no injuries of any kind, nor signs of swelling that I could determine. His skin looked fresh, his hair combed perfectly. The only thing I couldn't quite pinpoint was the smell. It was still there, surrounding me on all sides. Like a ghost that lingers near the departed, it was crushing me like an anvil. What the fuck had happened to him? I took out my phone again, desperate for a signal. This house needed to be raided, the entire thing stripped from top to bottom. I was sure that there was no way these boy had died of natural causes and I was willing to bet my life that the girl upstairs was also in danger. Since it was clear I wasn't going to be able to make a phone call, I did the next best thing. I placed the lantern against the edge of the coffin and angled my phone to get a good snapshot. Evidence of this macabre affair, I told myself as the flash went off. The light revealed I was not alone. A shadow, tall and feminine, stood at the edge of the coffins just out of my line of sight. The moment the flash happened, I stumbled backward, recognizing her as the little girl from upstairs. I dropped my phone and found myself grasping the wall, her bland expression and cold demeanor making me feel uneasy. How, how did you get down here? I asked. She held a finger to her lips and gently pointed toward the wall behind her. It looked like a dumb waiter, and she had used it to travel from above. I got back on my feet, my heart racing as I approached the coffins. You shouldn't be here. You shouldn't see them like this, I said. She didn't appear to be concerned about the strange way her siblings had died. died. Instead, she got near the coffins, staring at them. It didn't seem like she understood the gravity of the situation. You said, I could say goodbye, she whispered. She extended her hand toward me, as if expecting me to give her something. Then I remembered she had placed something in my pocket. I reached in a bit startled to find it was in fact a small jar that held a deadly black widow inside. Instinctively I dropped it and the jar rolled to her feet. She bent over, 
picking it up affectionately and then unlatching the jar. I watched with morbid fascination as she took it out to her open palm and then invited the spider to crawl into her mouth. I was too mortified to stop her. She then turned her head over to the boy and placed her lips against the deceased boy's mouth. I watched silently with concern and worry as I saw the spider crawl from her mouth into the corpse, wriggling its way inside. I looked up the stairs, the empty door beckoning me to run. Then I saw something that made me pause. It was right there, amid the rest of the trash that had piled up in the basement. A family portrait, covered in that grime and mucus, but what it revealed made my blood run cold. It looked like it was taken almost thirty years ago, perhaps even forty given the way the family dressed. Thomas was standing front and center, surrounded by eight boys and smiling like a proud father should, except these children looked identical to the one I just saw in the coffin. I was certain of it. All the same. They hadn't aged a day. That knot in my stomach returned as I looked at the child again, anxiety building, blood running cold and face flushed with fear. You said you would help, the girl snarled, her eyes flickering toward the lantern I held. Why won't you help us? I stumbled toward the steps, my feet moving faster than I could think. Thomas was at the top, still waiting impassively as I pushed past him to the door. I ran to my hearse, jumping and cranking the engine as fast as I could. Scrambling to find my phone, I soon realized I had left it in the basement below. Fuck that, I shouted, as I pressed into reverse and floored it to get away from that house. I didn't look back and didn't stop driving until I had reached Stacy's apartment. I banged on her door for about three minutes, loud enough for the whole neighborhood to hear. When she answered, the first thing I demanded was to use her phone and I called the police. Damn it. Why don't they answer? I mumbled as I tried again. Stacy wrapped a robe around herself as she shut the door. Maybe because it's almost four in the fucking morning. Jesus, Marcus, what the hell happened to you? I was visibly shaking. I had a breakdown in her living room, trying to comprehend everything I had just seen and heard. Stacy had me settle on the couch and brought me warm tea and blankets, insisting I relax and tell her what happened. I tried my best, but it just brought looks of disbelief and confusion. Marcus, you aren't making sense. You're talking in circles. Stacy, I know what I saw in that fucking house. That old man, damn him. I don't know what the fuck he is doing to that girl, but I know it's fucked up, I shouted. Calm down. Don't raise your voice. I didn't say I don't believe you. It was a nightmare. The worst thing I've ever seen, I kept repeating. Somehow she managed to get me to rest. First thing in the morning I called the police, demanding they do a wellness check on Mr. Eldon. There is a dead child in there, and God knows what else, I told them. Stacy managed to get me to try and resume having a normal day, being a bit more affectionate than usual. Maybe it was my broken spirit that made her feel attached. Several hours later, the police came by with puzzled expressions and questions. You claim that you were inside Thomas Eldon's house from the hours of 3.30 to about 4.30, is that correct? Yes, yes, that's right. Did you find the body? He was in the basement. The police shared a look of unease toward each other. Sir, there was nothing in the basement or anywhere else in the house except for one corpse, that of Mr. Eldon himself. What? My voice cracked. We didn't come by earlier because we wanted our coroner to confirm that the death was natural causes. We'll likely be taking it to your funeral home by midday. Check again. This time, they had a look of amusement on their faces. I think we would have seen something like what you described. Have a good day, the second man said, tipping his hat and exiting the apartment. Stacy pressed against me, telling me maybe to forget the whole thing, but I couldn't. I told her I had to go file some paperwork and we would catch up after lunch. Instead, my drive took me back to the Eldon estate. The gate was still open and the house looked just as abandoned as the night before. I parked outside and tried the door, a bit startled that it wasn't locked. Rosa? I called out. No one replied. I took a few steps inside and looked at all the stuff. Everything was exactly as I had seen it the night before. The door to the basement was still open, but instead to the den, calling out to Thomas or anyone that might be there. As I passed the hallway, I saw some of the doors in the hallway were now open, 
unlatched by the police, no doubt. All of them looked like they were decorated for the children that had died over time, with games and gifts and toys of every sort. I stepped into the medical suite to see the body of Thomas for myself. The coroner hadn't taken it away just yet. My heart skipped a beat as I pulled back the sheet, seeing a familiar young face. The body from the basement. I stumbled away from the body, confused by the revelation. If he was the deceased, where the hell was Thomas and the girl? I heard something behind me and stifled back a scream when the county coroner came into the room. Lavis, are you, uh, supposed to be here? She asked. I steadied my hands and looked toward for the coffin I had seen earlier. It was gone. I found myself trying to comprehend what had happened. The coroner saw my panic, trying to get me to answer her question. I did my best. Police said the body was heading to my funeral home. Figured I would save you the trouble. She huffed as she pulled a gurney into the room. Then you should have called me. I stepped aside and watched silently as she placed the young body on the stretcher. The police said your report identified the deceased as Mr. Eldon, I said as she covered the body up. That's right. Why? How did you identify him? Blood tests. Obviously. I swear, Lavise, you act like I graduated yesterday. I said nothing as she pushed the body toward the stairs and paused, looking toward the children's rooms. Where is the family? She asked. I admitted I didn't know since that was the truth. I guess it's better this way. Kind of weird, though. I would have expected him to be a lot older than this, she said as she carefully guided the gurney down the stairs. When we got to the front door, she asked me a question, but I was staring down at the basement. I was sure I heard breathing. Marcus, she snapped. What? Sorry, distracted. I said, did you notify the next of kin? I told her I would, and we left together, my mind filled with unease as I followed her car to the funeral home. Is there going to be a full autopsy? I asked as the coroner wheeled the body into my embalming room. I don't see why there would be a need. It was natural causes, she said, passing me paperwork to sign. A few seconds later, I was alone with the corpse. I stood there staring at the young body for the longest time, trying to decide what to do. I focused on a scar that ran along his side near his abdomen. Then I saw the faintest of movements underneath his skin. It made my own skin crawl. Thomas's words echoed in my head. Take the body tonight. Destroy it. Do not look at it. Why had he made such requests? What secrets did this corpse hold? I turned on my crematory furnace, steadying myself as I decided to simply end this whole thing and forget it ever happened. Maybe once this body is gone, I can wake from this nightmare. The heat from the furnace was enough to make me sweat. Flames licked the body and I watched as it began to burn. Its skin turned black and its eyes began to melt away the flesh smelling rotten and putrid, reminding me of the young girl. As the body faded away, I saw something move from the chest cavity, its silhouette revealing an arachnid form as it crawled through the furnace. It was screaming the way a little infant might, angry and confused and hungry. It looked like it had the face of the girl. I was certain I heard a voice rattling in my head. You were supposed to help us. Then the spidery monster disappeared from sight slinking into the shadows from where it had come. I sat there, stone-faced and trembling for what felt like hours. Stacy actually came by for lunch and found me apparently wandering the funeral home like I was in a daze. I didn't want to admit what I had seen. I couldn't comprehend any of it. The next day, I was told the next of kin was going to arrive to retrieve the ashes. I didn't know what to expect given the nightmares I'd witnessed thus far. I stepped into the funeral home with the jar and saw a young man standing there. He looked about the same height as Mr. Eldon, but with a much healthier body. I offered the jar to him, trying to remain calm as we met eye to eye. I could swear one of his eyes was fake, just like the old man. My condolences, I said. He smiled. That awful breath still smelled the same. Death is a part of life, my boy. What ends one thing begins something new. He passed me a stack of hundred-dollar bills. For your services, Mr. Levice. I watched him leave and stood near the steps as he got into a long car and drove toward the edge of town. I didn't stop holding my breath until I saw the car disappear behind the iron gate and then watched it close. One final thing stuck in my head, the license plates. Memento mori. Remember you will die.